Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Enterprise Scaling Panel. Um, we've got uh, three experts here today. I'm going to have them introduce themselves really quickly. Ken? Uh, Ken Fromm. So I'm with uh, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, also a venture called Buildeth, a uh, long time early internet days, Web 2.0, serverless, and then now crypto. So a lot of new technologies, new, new waves. So really bullish on uh, the crypto and the Ethereum space. Awesome. Hi, I'm Amy Fisher. I'm from R3. R3's platform is called Corda. Um, and I lead out our efforts in energy, oil, and gas. And I recently moved from New York to San Francisco, so it's great to be here. We're building out a team out here as well. And hi, everybody. My name is Chen Zor. I lead the EY's uh, advisory blockchain practice. Uh, have been dealing with the enterprise software uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, a true believer of the, of the revolution blockchain will bring uh, into the enterprise world and uh, looking forward for this discussion. Uh, I want to start this with a story. I had breakfast this morning with uh, someone who founded a company, an enterprise blockchain company, and she conceded to me, and this is, remember, an enterprise person, that 70% uh, of alleged use for enterprise blockchain is bullshit. Um, and I thought that was surprising, especially from someone from the sector. So would you guys agree with, uh, is 70% of it bullshit? Uh, I'll let you start. Jeff. Yeah, okay. So, so first of all, yes, I don't know if it's 70, 80, 60, but I definitely spend more time saying no to use cases than saying yes. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, even if we go with a 70% number that is bullshit, there's 30% that is real. And, and we, if we do the multiplications, it's still uh, phenomenally, phenomenally huge. So... No. Go ahead. No, you please. So I think 70% may be a bit high, but I've also seen a shift um, in the, from you know, two years ago to now where there was a lot of hype around blockchain in general, you know, really tied to the, the crypto wave. And I think the use cases we're seeing now and the conversations we're having now, the, the quality is much higher. So I think 70% 70 may, 70 may have been true two years ago, three years ago. Um, but where we are now, I, I think it's, it's quite, quite a bit lower than that. Um, I think it's somewhere 50%. You know, I think in terms of, um, you know, you look at different waves of technology, early internet days, people were taking uh, paper uh, and putting them onto digital and they were, you know, not satisfactory. I mean, you'd still want your newspaper because your digital paper was slow and it was just not done well. Only happened when they became up with new paradigms. They were able to understand what was good, you know, unique about digital. I think the same way here is you're starting to see a lot of use cases, which really makes sense. You're starting to make use of um, cases where you understand the power of digital currency or digital assets, and you go, oh my God, this is transformational. So I do think that if you just take it a one-to-one -one mapping, you're not get, gonna get the same value. You need a 5X return for people to move to a new technology. If you're just getting a one-to-one -one or a 2X, you're not gonna get it. But the cases that you are seeing emerging do get to that aha moment. So I think it's true, but the cases you're getting are really powerful and really compelling. Yeah. Oh, so even if it is only 30% of it's viable, I think, Chen, you make a good point, that's still a lot of applications, a lot of business, a lot of commerce. And that leads to the question of which chain. And uh, Amy, I'm going to put you on the spot, because sort of someone who's not, I'm not that close to enterprise, but from what I'm going to see, it seems Ethereum is the only game in town. That's where the developers are. That's, you know, despite its flaws. So why do we need something like R3 and Corda? Is there a chance you guys are just going to become the lotus notes of... Uh, oh. <laughs> it's a great question, um, and I'm excited to answer it. So the reason that the Corda platform exists is because of those, those challenges and problems with the, with the other uh, protocols and platforms. So R3 started as a consortium conversation of financial institutions and banks that were dealing with these types of technologies. We had a lab, an incubator model. We were building on the Bitcoin blockchain, building on Ethereum, building on Hyperledger. And really from these initial experiments in the lab, realized that there was no platform that was fit for purpose for enterprise-grade technology. So pivoted um, rather quickly and sharply to become an enterprise platform company, built from the ground up, and it's kind of an interesting story of having the business requirements first and building the platform to meet those needs. So solving for the challenges of privacy and scalability um, really, really uh, are, are why Cordis exists. But uh, gee, I'm just gonna stick yeah. with you for a sec longer. What about in terms of attracting developers? You know, like the people here at this conference. Yeah. Uh, how many of them want to go write Corda? So Corda is written in Kotlin, which is a derivation of, of Java. And I, I think it's interesting because 
you know, when you look at uh, certainly like the, the sexy new languages that people out there trying to code in, I, I think I take a step back from that and think about, okay, uh, solving interesting problems, right? Solving interesting problems on a platform that's credible, that's easier to use, and that can have success in the long run. So if you're looking at B2B, you should definitely be looking at building on Corda. Okay, and let's flip it. Kevin, I'll put it to you now. Um, so I'm, I'm a big business, I wanna deploy this, but the reality is Ethereum blockchain is, is, is you know, the throughput. It's just, it, it's not prime time ready, and every year they promise it will be, and it just doesn't seem that's ever gonna come. So perhaps businesses should seek out something and apparently does seem fit for purpose, like R3 or one of those. Well, I think that uh, what you're seeing is you're seeing the developer community and you're also seeing the mainnet being extremely powerful, the public, uh, from a standpoint of double spend, which I think mm -hmm. Chen will talk about. Mm -hmm. But I think that's really powerful. You're seeing this whole concept of the mainnet and EEA started an initiative on the mainnet, which means the public Ethereum, but it does allow room for alternative subchain, side chains, alternative blockchains, whatever you want to call them, that can actually pin the data or use the mainnet as the timing chain. So I think that within EEA, we've got a number of companies that have built uh, their own uh, blockchain layer one, layer two platforms, uh, and I think that's still gonna be powerful because there are capabilities you may not want to have on the mainnet, either for privacy or uh, permissioned aspect or because of, of scalability. And so I do understand the need for layer two aspects, uh, but I do see we're seeing the, the tie-in and the important, the critical nature of the Ethereum mainnet rise as sort of the timing chain or you know the one chain to, to, to use either message bus or as uh, I think Chen will talk about in terms of the double spend. Yeah, so Chen, who's gonna win or is there room for both? So, so the, way, the way we see it, uh, first of all, the Lotus Note example is reserved for IBM. So uh, <laughs> that's the way at least I see it. But, but the way we see it, the, the only way for blockchains to scale is eventually to go public, uh, as we said, uh, because of the double spend prevention issue in order to really be sure that, that we don't double spend value, everybody needs to play in the same network and that probably means uh, uh, whatever Ethereum evolves to. In the meantime, it's not, it, it, having said that, as you said, it's gonna take years, a few years until we get there. And it doesn't mean that enterprises don't do anything until then. Uh, for us, at least, it makes much more sense to use Ethereum-compatible networks, such as Chrome would be a good example, or any other kind of private Ethereum that, that first of all, allows us already to embed capabilities that, that, and test capabilities that will be needed for the future Ethereum. For example, uh, to, to put zero-knowledge proof capabilities in contracts on a private network that will later migrate easily to the public network. And this is how we, we see enterprise solutions of, uh, evolve. And when then the Ethereum network is ready, uh, migrate to, to the public Ethereum, or at least, at least use the public Ethereum to, to manage the double spend prevention. So you're predicting Ethereum is gonna be the only game in town. It might take a while, but that's how it's gonna end? I. I and yes, and with, with small, a small caveat, uh, private networks will and can be used for solving for specific use cases and specific issues, as long as they use the public Ethereum in order to, to interact with the external world in terms of, of moving tokens and moving value. Um, and so you, you mentioned use cases. As a reporter, over the years, my inbox is full of, have you heard of that you're moving lettuce or diamonds or fish on a blockchain? And you know, frankly, not to call it IBM, but they like recycling the same story all on, over and over because they can say they're blockchain. But you know, it, it sort of seems the story's been the same for a while. I've got the same pitch of like, you know, lettuce being tracked on a blockchain. But in the real world, what is, you know, is there kind of a killer app for it yet? Is it shipping supplies? Is it produce supplies? Is it finance? What's, what's gonna be the breakout thing? And are we anywhere we weren't two years ago? So I'll, I'll start here. I, I would say, first of all, that the food trust, for example, is maybe a shared ledger, but I would claim that since it's not moving value, it's just notarizing transactions, I would claim or ask, is it a real blockchain? Uh, it's not moving tokens around, it's not moving value. So question. As for, as for 
the killer apps, they would be around moving value in many, many different industries, uh, uh, tokenizing inventory and moving it around is one example. Uh, rights and royalties is another example that, that we see, we see uh, emerging sooner rather than later because rights and royalties and IP are easier to manage because they don't have a physical uh, uh, thing attached to it that you need to move. Um, that would be my answer. Amy, can I move this to you? Sure, absolutely. Apps? I think you know, the killer app question always comes up, and I think we haven't seen this, but a, there's a lot going on in the enterprise space that's perhaps um, not in the public eye uh, be, because it's, it, it's making transformational change on different levels, and I, I think there's a lot of iteration that happens on these. So when I, I like to take this back to an analogy. When you think about you know, when the internet first came out in the early 70s, I don't think folks were sitting around these massive computers thinking that they'd be able to watch cat videos and the Super Bowl streaming on a cell phone, this, this iPhone thing that didn't exist. There's been a lot of iteration that happens, and I think iteration is really important in technology, and, and that's the path we're on. But to, to talk about the use cases that are, and, and tokenization in specifically, Tradewind Markets is a, a startup out of New York City that has tokenized gold backed by the Royal Canadian Mint. It has been live for over a year, and they're focused on tokenizing different types of physical and non-physical assets, starting with gold, silver, and, and merging into more. They've been doing really well, and they've been doing really well quietly. Um, you can also look in the insurance space. Um, insurance smart contracts, and InsureWave was actually built by, mm -hmm. by EY on, on Corda. It's live today, and it's uh, you know, estimated over 300 uh, million dollars of savings per year. And there's a lot going on in industries that are perhaps not on the forefront of where folks are looking to have the big change. So if you look at insurance, trade finance is another great example. Um, and I think there are industries that are moving forward, uh, looking at these use cases, but they're doing so in a quiet way that isn't moving a lot of waves. Um, I think uh, there's a couple cases. An easy case would be um, sort of pinning data to the blockchain to, as a proof of data, proof of authority. So instead of, you know, where you're doing right signature or you're doing any of the DocuSign or just PDF docs, um, now you can do sort of any form of data, a uh, database, a uh, set of data, uh, a financial statement, pin it to the blockchain, um, and, and there we, you have the proof of data. So that's really a use case where you're, you're like, wow, that's really powerful because it extends beyond just a, a document into data, uh, and I think that's really powerful. Um, you get into other things where tele, uh, tele, tele, telecom where you've got uh, a, a roaming call reconciliation. And that's where you know, the carriers have to get together and figure out how to, to reconcile all the different roaming charges. And some of the use cases we've seen there are really powerful because it's not just, uh, it's really allow, uh, creating a new capability that may not be existing or is it really a lot of ETL, a lot of integration, everybody's got a different system. Now when you move it up to, you've got a unified data layer, or data schema, you've got smart contracts that are tried and trusted among everybody. It's really powerful where you say, okay, now we're moving up from this world of integration and everybody has siloed data into, let's use a common data format, let's use common processing, so it's sort of serverless, but now it's serverless plus because it's um, you know, arbitrated through the blockchain. Uh, really powerful use cases where it does get you that 5x return because you've eliminated a lot of this data silo, data integration, oh, I've got to write a new contract specifically for this partner. Um, and I think you can see the value is in um, the, how, how you move it across and how the system grows as you get new par partners in as a part of it. And in practice, are you talking about on the main chain or side chains? Or? I think uh, it'd be on, on a side chain likely um, because you'd want to sort of be permission network, but I think what to Chen's point is that you're going to want to pin it to a main net, uh, which would likely you know, be Ethereum. Huh. And stick with Ethereum a bit more, um, just the scaling problem, because that's the, the topic here. And as I said, I mean, I'm a little more removed, but I've watched it for a long time. And the governance thing, I mean, how or is that ever going to be solved? Because I think Vitalik's brilliant, but it also strikes me a little bit as a cult of personality. And, you know, every year there's another conference in Japan and other announcements and Casper this. And it's just, it doesn't seem to be, it just seems too... I don't know, disorganized to, to, to get together. I mean, you know, how is this going to end, Chen? So the way we see it, the, the, there's only one eventuality, which is this is going to be solved. It's, it's taking a long time, uh, but, but it is going there, and there's no real other scalability option. I think that we spoke earlier, and with all due respect to all the technical issues, as, as someone who interacts with the enterprises themselves, the real scalability issue is, is around adoption and uh, around getting organizations to 
agree to share data and share common business processes. And, and the technical issues are there, but, and they are difficult, but they will be solved. And they are solved little by little. And the real challenge is, of, if you ask me about scalability, is, is enterprise, enterprises and competitors agreeing to, to sit together and, and, and share common business logic. But who's going to take the lead? I mean, is there like the VP of product at like IBM or Microsoft going to sit down with Vitalik and figure this out? Or who, who is specifically going to push it forward? That, that's a good question. And I think that, that there's a lot of, of enterprises like Microsoft, for example, or UI and a lot of others contributing uh, actively and spending a lot of capital contributing to this uh, environment in order to move it forward. And, and the governance issue is a true challenge. Um, yeah, think, Amy, do you think it's Yeah, well, I think you can't uh, solve for scaling without having scalability. So even if you do get all the folks around the room, which, which certainly is a challenge, I think we're seeing more and more collaboration um, within, the, within the core ecosystem, which is fantastic. But even if you have all the right players in the room uh, and, and everyone's agreeing, agreeing to do it, if the technology doesn't work, then you're screwed, right? And I think, uh, you know, so to, to, to quote uh, Dave Hudson, who's our, our lead, uh, he leads our engineering team, he says, uh, you know, Ethereum scaling, right? Com solution coming every year since 2014. And I think from that perspective, we keep waiting and keep waiting. And especially if you look at folks in enterprises, they're getting tired of hearing about blockchain and all these successes because things have not happened yet. So from that perspective, if you, consistently are able to get folks around the room to agree on it, if the transaction throughput is only single digits or double digits, that's not gonna scale for the enterprise. And we've worked really closely. Um, DTC did a test uh, using Corda a couple versions ago and it scaled to meet daily volume. So 115 million transactions a day and that equates to 6,300 transactions per second for a Corda node. So we've been really looking at this and have some really bright minds like Mike Hearn, who was one of the original Bitcoin developers working on these problems from the beginning. Are we 100% there yet? Could we plug everything into that today? No, but I, I feel much more confident with structure and a team in place to work on these challenges rather than leaving it up to, you know, they will be solved. I think being more proactive about it is, is the way that we, we look at it from the R3 perspective, well, and it's can, why we exist. Ken, you've got a front row seat to this and the governance thing. Yeah. I mean, do you see things getting any better? Or? Well, I think from the, if you're talking to ETH 2.0, I mean, I come from the serverless world, had a serverless platform, and the thing there is that, you know, the, the analogy we came up with was that it was like changing the engine on a, on a, on a 747 in flight. You know, it's not an easy thing to do, and so I think it's going to take probably longer than you think it is, but when it does, I think that it'll be robust and secure and it solve a lot of issues. And I feel confident, knowing a lot of people involved, that the ETH 2.0 you know, issue will be, will be solved. It was Jensen. But I also think that ETH 2.0, we're already sort of here in a sense where I look at it from a community perspective and adoption, as well as you know, the component technologies and companies. And there was a, a slide that Amber Data a Company put out that showed the smart contracts and all the connections between the smart contracts. And a year ago, you just saw singletons. You just saw smart contracts being used individually. Now you're seeing smart contracts contracts connect to other smart contracts. And so Uniswap to DX, DY, DY, DX to, um, to Compound. So they're really starting to leverage a lot of different components and capabilities. And that's, to me, ETH 2.0 is that you're seeing a lot of these companies really work together, uh, starting to use a lot of these components, a lot of other smart contracts. And that's extremely powerful because you get that network effect that really allows you to take off. So from that standpoint, there's the technical, I guess, governance, but then there's also sort of just how it's being used um, and that seems to be up and to the right. And, and I have to, uh, this is a great discussion, but, and, and the way we see it, it's not that, that Ethereum is, is ungoverned because a lot of, of, at least in the enterprise area, a lot of projects that are using private versions of Ethereum are solving uh, things like scalability on a smaller scale. And I think this is the, the right way to go forward as long as you use the same protocols and the same mechanisms and the same technology, things like, like scalability of, or throughput of transactions are solved in a smaller scale on, on private Ethereum's and eventually these solutions will be the right way to, to, to migrate to the public Ethereum and, and solve these problems. What concerns me a little bit about that is, because if you think of Ethereum as the 
one big supercomputer. When you have these side chains and you're retrofitting this technology to be fit for, for purpose to an enterprise, mm -hmm. you're spinning up a lot of mini computers. It's, this is the way I simplistically think about it. The amount of energy that that would take if we're scaling this, that's, you could, that might be, your, your business network might be using the same amount of energy as a small country. So f first of all, the, the energy specific issue is definitely solvable, but, but what, what I'm talking about is, is what we are doing is taking these infrastructural problems that we are solving on a, on a private Ethereum level, and, and we, we talked about that, and literally putting it on the public domain for it to be adopted by, by the public network. There's no intention to monetize these infrastructural solutions that, that are needed in order for the public Ethereum to scale. Jen, I want to explore something quickly. At, yeah. You're in on the big consultancy EY, and you're the blockchain guy, right? Not the Ethereum guy. The blockchain guy, yeah. So I'm curious, like within EY, is there talk about anything besides Ethereum? What about like Tezos or Definity or EOS? I mean, are those, do those, you know, are people even talking about them? Do they have a chance? So, so EY is a big organization and there's different things that we do. In terms of uh, auditing, we are definitely uh, looking at many different blockchains. In terms of scaling enterprise, we are mostly focused on, on, on Ethereum, but, but as Amy said, we do have, for example, uh, the issue wave, which is Corda. But, but our main focus and belief is that Ethereum is required for this to scale. Oh. Um, I'd love to throw, we've got about uh, four minutes left. I'd love to throw it to questions if anyone has any. Anyone? Okay. <clears throat> well, good thing I've got a couple more. Um, uh, can you raise a, a, a good thing before we... Uh, Walked up in terms of uh, what do you guys read to stay up on? Because there's, you know, I don't want to call it FUD, but there's a lot of bad reporting and there's a lot of, you know, tangentious stuff. So how do you cut through all the, the crap to figure out what's going on? Well, for me, I think uh, crypto Twitter is, is powerful. Um, I think part of it is also learning that you got to, you know, I, I, as I've gotten older, I've gotten a slower learner, so I've got to see things three or four times. So, you know, I, I sort of don't get anxious if I see something and I don't really understand it, Z-curves or what have you. And I realize that it's got to take me three or four times until it maybe, you know, it sinks in. And if you, you know, crypto Twitter allows you to sort of scan and then kind of see, pop up what's, what's important, and then, and then you can deep dive in. But a lot of times I just don't get it the first time, and so it takes me a couple times to really Call see it. Call it any understand. names on crypto Twitter? Pardon? Uh, Evan, uh, Evan Van Ness, which is this week in Twitter. Uh, there's a guy, Stephen, Stephen uh, Moon. There's uh, Haseeb uh, Qureshi, who just put out a really cool article. Um, but I think just, you know, you start following a few this week in Twitter, and then you see who they're following and who's responding to those chains, and you just keep following those. So I think, you know, finding a few, Evan Van Ness, um, and uh, who's Ryan St. Adams, and then follow who they're, they're following or who's commenting on their chains, and then just build up that list. And it may take three months, six months, but over time, you end up uh, reducing your anxiety uh, in your information overload because you realize you don't have to learn it in a day or a week, or suddenly like, oh my god, what, 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 what am I missing? You can do it over time. That might be the first time I've heard someone say that reading crypto Twitter reduces anxiety from the other <laughs> way, but, uh, but good on you. Um, Amy, who do you I, read? I would crypto? agree on the, the crypto Twitter piece of it, um, especially the, the crypto trolls are hilarious also. Um, but in, in terms of beyond that, I, I, I really enjoy reading. There's, there's some good blogs out there, Anthony Lewis. Richard Gendel Brown. Uh, I also I also tap into a lot of WhatsApp and Telegram groups, which is just a great way to synthesize information quickly. We have an unofficial R3 WhatsApp group that that does a really great job of that, and, and even is ahead of our Slack channels sometimes because things come out faster on your phone. Um, so that that's that's something that I look at as well. But we have blogs, and then I think for if you're looking at an introductory piece, there are, there's a lot of fun out there when you're trying to figure out the you know. How many years later is it? 11 years later, we're still trying to figure out what WTF is, is Bitcoin. Um, there's Anthony Lewis, who I mentioned, has a really good basics book um, as well. So uh, you're not going to like my answer. I, 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 I just use um, a, a lot of the internal EY blockchain network to, to filter out uh, for me. Like wh whatever surfaces up, this is what I read. and, and I don't do the, the directly following all the feeds because it's simply too much. Okay, no, you, you're right. I don't love that answer. You've got to be a little more specific. Yeah. Who, oh, yeah, I'll put it another way. Who do you think is the most important one or two thinkers in blockchain right now? Well, one obvious answer, but, but 
I'm answering honestly, I think Paul Brody, like the, the global blockchain leader in EY, I think that the way he sees this developing is, is the way I, I used to describe it is, is if blockchain is a religion, uh, which some would argue it is, at least partially, then, then Paul is one of the, on the, of the prophets. Um, so he's one, I think, uh, uh, Joe Lubin has some very good ideas, a little further out there, a little less connected to enterprise specifically, but, but I also think, uh, like he's thinking around this. Okay, and just to, to wrap it up, uh, Amy and Ken, the most important influential thinkers right now in blockchain? Uh, I think Mike Hearn is someone who's been involved since the beginning and he's someone to continue to watch. Um, I think I mentioned Richard Gendel Brown's another good one to follow, yeah. Um, I think Evan Van Ness just in, this week in Ethereum, just because yeah. he'll link you to a lot of links. Um, I think Ryan St. Adams is his name, I think. He's talking about DeFi and Bankless, um, really powerful stuff on DeFi. And then John Wolpert, who's from Consensus, who was a founder of Hyperledger, um, and who's also talking about the main net and tying in the main net. So really good thinkers and also really up on a lot of the componentry and, and cool things involved in, 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 in Ethereum and in blockchain. Okay, really helpful. I, I learned a lot, so please give it up for our panelists here, please.